Um, thank you very much for that introduction um, and for the invitation to be here today. Um, when I got the invitation, I was not surprised to see Mike Zaniga's name behind it, um, largely because for some of you may not know, I did um, two years of a fellowship uh, with him in Santa Barbara. And at the end of that fellowship, when I got my faculty position at University of Pennsylvania, he gave me one thing, which is a book bigger larger than I am, basically, um, that is, uh, it has really beautiful leather outside. It was completely empty, black, blank pages, and it had a note with three words, think big thoughts. Um, so I'm not surprised, nothing has changed. Um, all right, so what I wanted to tell you about today is a network neuroscience of human learning, um, potential to inform quantitative theories of brain and behavior. And um, why, why, why does this relate to big ideas? Um, because I think, that what happens when you're trying to think about big ideas is that you first think about the questions that you're most excited about, but most of the time those are questions that you've at least made some headway on. Otherwise, they're just purely frustrating, right? Um, so I think when you, what I'm going to have today is an arc of the exciting ideas that I think we have made headway on, and then the frustrations and the failures, which I think are the openings for the really big ideas. Um, so that's what I wanted to, uh, that's the arc of what I'm going to do today. Okay, so to start off with, if we think about neural signatures of learning, um, depending on who you're talking to, that you might be thinking about synaptic changes, you might be thinking about white or gray matter changes, you might, might be thinking about white matter architecture that supports those changes. Um, um, or you might be thinking about individual brain regions whose activity changes over time when somebody is learning. Um, you may lastly be thinking about changes in functional connectivity or effective connectivity that enable somebody to learn. So there are many different imaging modalities, um, different scales, spatial scales, temporal scales that you might be thinking about when you think about neural signatures of learning. What I like to do um, um, is to think about learning from a network perspective, scaling beyond just two or three connections and really thinking about whole patterns of connectivity in the human brain. Um, and the reason that I like to do that is that I think that cognitive processes, including learning but not just learning, um, often require varied computations that are performed by many different regions. Um, and they also often elicit activity in spatially distributed circuits. And if activity is being elicited in spatially distributed circuits, then there must be an underlying network architecture that is facilitating that spatially distributed effect, right? Um, so we spend a lot of our time thinking about different types of network architectures and um, across many different scales. We're interested in particular in questions about not just um, which regions may be uh, affe affected in learning or driving learning, which single connections may be affected, but also larger scale groups of interactions that may be important. In this particular case, I'm actually so showing you simplicial complexes, which are densely interconnected groups of uh, brain regions that can help um, with encoding and with um, performance of a task. But we're also just as interested in where the holes are inside of these networks. So it's not just where the dense connections are, but it's also what is not connected that matters for how this system actually functions. So what we try to do is to use tools and develop tools that help us to see where the dense clusters are, but also where they're not, um, and sort of looking at the structure and the holes to better understand what happens in learning. But when we're looking at these network architectures, I think there's a really, there's a, you could go about it in two ways. You could first of all just say, well, I'm going to use a data-driven approach, I'm going to look for whatever structure exists, um, and I'm going to go into it with sort of an open, very free mind. On the other hand, you could say, well, there's been a lot of work in this area for a long time, um, and potentially there are principles of learning and adaptation that we could use to better search our networks for signatures of learning. And I think the latter is, is, is really where I fall, that there's been a lot of work in this area suggesting that adaptation and learning um, capitalize on modular systems or modularity in a system. And that uh, idea has been around at the top. I'm showing you um, figures from Darwin Finch's, the notion that morphology um, is modular and there's modularity of structure that enables systems to evolve and develop over long periods of time. There's also obviously the idea of modularity in the mind. This is not something that's, that's a new idea. This is several decades old or even before that if you want to go back to sort of ancient philosophers. Um, but the idea that there are parts of the brain that are coding for specific cognitive functions and that those may be separate modules that you may call into play um, for different tasks that you need to perform. 
That notion of modularity is something that's very simply studied in networks as well. So on the bottom of this graph, what I'm showing you is a set of networks that are highly modular. So modularity in a network or a graph means that there are dense um, patterns of connectivity between a set of nodes, but then not very many connections between other sets, right? So here, for example, is a highly modular network. It has three little modules um, that are densely connected internally, but sparsely connected between modules. And we can show that those um, can actually change over time. So these modules allow a notion of, of evolution and adaptation. So first question is, do we actually see these signatures of modularity in functional brain networks? And this is something that has consistently been identified by ne many labs over the last decade. <clears throat> This particular example is from a, a paper from Washington University in St. Louis from Steve Peterson's group. Um, but many other groups have shown the same thing, which is that you have um, on the left-hand side a pattern of connectivity that's extracted from functional magnetic resonance imaging from these particular regions that are shown as circles or spheres on the surface of the brain. Um, the way that these connections are uh, defined is that they are um, functional connections, meaning that there are two regions will be connected if they show similar patterns of activity over time, as measured by, for example, a coherence or a correlation in time series. We can search for modules in this organization um, by performing uh, clustering techniques. One particular example is modularity maximization, which we like very much um, because it really takes into account and capitalizes on the very special structure that's present in, in network type data. So what you can do by applying that technique is to identify clusters of brain regions that are more densely interconnected with one another than they would be um, to another group here. And in addition to noticing that these modules exist, many uh, uh, labs have identified that several of these modules really seem to code for or be composed of regions that code for a similar function. So regions that are in visual cortex, for example, tend to be very densely connected with one another in this network. Regions in motor cortex tend to be densely connected with one another. Regions in um, the frontal parietal executive system tend to be very densely connected with one another. Um, so what seems to be the case is that these modules not only exist, but they help us to understand the very basic building blocks of, of many cognitive functions. And I think that's been very exciting over the last couple of years, but we're, I've also, also left feeling a little bit um, unfulfilled because when we're talking about learning or adaptation, we have to be talking about a dynamic picture of the brain. We can't be talking about a static picture of the brain. So while modularity may be important for learning, that's not the only story. Um, so what we've been doing in the lab and, and um, and others as well, has been to really focus on the dynamic processes in networks that may help uh, to support adaptation and learning, um, and really try to understand a little bit more about how these networks change, how they change differently in different individuals, and how we can try to understand and predict how much somebody is going to learn in the future, and thereby be able to identify interventions for individuals that are really tuned to their specific brain. So how do we do that um, from actual data? What we do is that we, again, treat the brain um, as a network. We separate it into individual pieces. We'll call them nodes inside of the network. We'll extract activity from each of those nodes, either using um, MRI, functional MRI, or MEG or ECOG or um, EEG, et cetera. So any functional neuroimaging uh, technique. And then we'll take individual time windows. So let's say I'm going to look at 30 seconds of, of data right now. I'm going to calculate the pattern of functional connections that's present in that 30 seconds. Then I'm going to take the next 30 seconds and the next 30 seconds and the next 30 seconds. And I will construct a, wind or a video of networks reconfiguring over time that characterize the patterns of um, functional connections that are present in the brain. One of the particular features that you observe when you do that from a lot of different sorts of neuroimaging data is that these modules are present very consistently over all of the different data sets that we've studied, but that they reconfigure also in a very um, canonical way in the sense that what we often observe is that there's a region of the brain that's not super strongly connected to one of the modules. It's sort of on the outside of the module. And then over time, it will get a new connection with um, a different module. So see, this pink one is getting a new connection with the yellow regions. Then it has more connections with the yellow regions and eventually loo loses its connections with the pink regions. So it's actually moving its allegiance to a module. It was in the pink module initially. It becomes part of the yellow module later. So this is a sort of reassignment of allegiance of a region to a module, which is what we, which is performing, uh, we think is performing a specific cognitive function. We can characterize these movements, um, and we we call them. Um, 
uh, network flexibility, where a, a, a person who has many of these movements over time will have a very flexible brain, and um, a person who has very few movements over time in their networks will be a, a, a more rigid brain. You can also quantify this for individual brain regions and show which regions are more flexible than others. And what we found over a several different studies is that these really flexible regions, the ones that are moving in their modular association over time, uh, tend to be largely in frontal parietal cognitive control areas. And importantly, they predict individual differences in several different tasks. We've now studied um, a motor learning task. This is a discrete sequence production task. We also show that it is um, positively correlated with cognitive flexibility. So the more network flexibility in your brain that you have have in this frontal parietal system, the more cognitive flexibility you have as measured by performance on a TRAILS B uh, test. We also show, um, and this is in collaboration with Heike Tost and Andreas Meyer Lindenberg at the Central Institute of Mental Health in Mannheim, Germany, that it's positively correlated with working memory performance as well. Again, higher flexibility, higher working memory performance. Um, and then in collaboration with Daphna Shohami at the University of Columbia, we also show that um, flexibility is positively correlated with reinforcement learning rate too. So that suggests that overall executive functions, including um, learning and memory and cognitive flexibility, are um, positively related to uh, network flexibility. Then the question is, can you actually alter that with, um, with uh, state of the person or um, with medication. And what we found um, in a recent paper that just came out a couple, two weeks ago or something, that um, this is work done by Rick Betzel in my group. He shows that network flexibility is modulated by fatigue. It's also modulated by positive mood and arousal. Um, so the more positive um, an individual was in this study, the more flexible the brain was. Um, the more fatigued, the less flexible the brain was. Um, again, in collaboration with Heike Toast and Andreas Meyer Lindenberg, um, we also show that the, if you use an NMDA receptor antagonist, you can actually increase flexibility of somebody's brain. So it is actually editable or, or you can modulate it with um, drugs. And in particular, that suggests that glutamate must be um, driving to some degree the alteration in um, flexibility. And it's finally implicated as an intermediate phenotype in schizophrenia, and that just came out as well. Um, I should just uh, clarify really quickly that this study um, from in linking it to uh, reinforcement learning rate, I'm showing you this negative correlation here, and this is because this learning rate on the y-axis is actually the alpha in a reinforcement learning um, model of behavior. So this indicates that people who have more whole brain flexibility are those that are um, integrating information over longer periods of time to make their uh, immediate decision. So to me, at this stage, these were the sort of exciting moments that we're identifying a network phenotype that is characteristic of an adaptive person, somebody who can learn in a variety of different settings, but also has high working memory capacity and high executive function and cognitive flexibility. Um, but now comes, to some degree, maybe not the failures, but what's missing from this story. And this is where I think are the openings for the new and next big ideas. Um, what I have shown you so far is really just focusing on the top part of this picture here, the network architecture and how it changes as a function of learning. However, we're sort of ignoring two other hugely important pieces of data um, that are you know, characteristic of how we are as humans. Um, the first is behavior, right? So right now I've shown you simple univariate correlations with behavior, a reaction time, a learning rate, a um, working memory performance, a single variable. Um, and it's a raw single variable. So I think that there's two ways that we should be extending that. One is that instead of just focusing on a single variable, we should have multi multivariate descriptors of behavior that, that we're bringing in with the multivariate descriptor of brain, right? If we're going to have all of this rich um, computational uh, frameworks and methods to understand the brain, we should use that same richness or allow that same richness in our assessments of behavior. 
Um, the second thing that I think is missing is that in behavior, we have this go these gorgeous models uh, that we can actually fit to the data and come up with parameters, like the alpha parameter for reinforcement learning rate, or like the drift diffusion model for decision making. There are these beautiful models of behavior um, that help us to generate hypotheses or generate theories about how the system actually works. Uh, and that, I think, is something that is currently missing from a lot of the work um, bridging network phenotypes with behavior. What we'd really like to understand is how to take these network phenotypes and link them in directly with models of behavior. And finally, the sort of big elephant in the room is that none of the data that I showed you clarified which regions of the brain were active, right? So using a simple general linear model or an assessment of power if you're using MEG or EEG, any of the, the simple statistics that we've known for decades now are very useful in helping us to understand what's happening in the brain. That's not present in any of these um, slides that I just showed you, right? So clearly we're missing out on um, all of that uh, additional information. And I think what's really needed is to bridge these three three types of information in a way that helps us to better understand learning um, and build fundamental theories of learning. So I wanted to highlight three specific challenges um, to just make them s extremely clear as, as what I think are really important things to do next. Um, the first one is that we need to bridge network descriptors of brain with univariate activation descriptors um, of the brain. So this is still just brain and brain, but bridging the network approach, which enables us to look at circuitry and have broader um, hypotheses about what uh, is really incorporating into these very um, complicated uh, cognitive processes, but also include information about the activation. To do that, there is actually a field uh, of, or a tool called an annotated graph that was de that's been developed in graph theory for a long time in mathematics, which basically enables you to attach a feature to any of the nodes inside of the network, right? So instead of have, I hear the dog. Um, so instead of having these nodes be, um, be blank, they can actually have uh, measures of activation on them. Secondly, we'd like to bridge descriptors of the network descriptors of the brain with models of behavior, such as reinforcement learning and drift diffusion models, but you can put in your favorite model there. And finally, have generative models and theories about the network dynamics itself. At the moment, while I think network uh, models are extremely useful, they're not theories in really the technical sense of the term. They don't necessarily generate um, new uh, frameworks for understanding what these data should look like. They really are, at this point, descriptors. And I think building theories is really critical for moving the field where it is now to the next stage. Um, that's it.